and keeping on uh, on track with the Wheeler and Bradley power hour or two. Um, I read so much Worm, or rather, I listened to. Yeah, it. this is our uh, famous segment. Take that, you Worm! You all know the name by now. I I made that up. No one knows the name. Everyone knows me. the name. You know, comment, smash like if you know the name. Comment, but... comment the words smash like if you know the name. <laughs> Um, before um, we actually do the segment, the, we have a we have a PSA where earlier today, oh yeah, I, I was reading through the massive trove of there's like a Word of God repository for Worm that is like as long as Worm itself, which is an exaggeration, but only barely. I was about to say, are you fucking serious? And um, I, I found a Word of God on Crawler's testicles because. When, when I say there's a word of God for everything, there's a word of God for just about everything. That's and ridiculous. And I sent, the, I sent Crawler's testicles to Willer. And Thank you for that. Yeah, and we got back on the subject of what the fuck is the deal with Crawler? Because, <laughs> and I, I put a post on the subreddit about this today before we started recording, because we were hoping we could get an answer to this before we started talking about Worm today. And it was like, Crawler's chest is described as being 10 feet deep from front to back, and he's probably much longer than that from head to tail. But in Imp's interlude, he's, like, inside of an apartment, just, like, chilling there with the rest of the nine. So I was like, what What does this apartment look like? How did he get in there? We need a word of God on this apartment, what it looks like. Or, like, is there a hole in the side of the building that he crawled in? We don't know. So, um... Everyone, give us your theories, your fan theories. Wild Bo, if you're out there, um, I, I really need this. This is a more important word of God than any other question you've ever answered. Wild Bo, this might save Crawler for me. It's important. Yeah. So, um, I'm a little underwhelmed at all the answers. My favorite one didn't even really answer the question. It was just <laughs> when Crawler sits around the house. He really sits around the house. Uh huh. <laughs> it made me laugh. And, um, and yeah. Some some guy is like, oh, he'll adapt his body, but I don't think that's how his adaption works. He needs to get no, hit. No, yeah, right? he, he doesn't. He doesn't choose his adaptations. Uh, Crawler only has most of his body in the flat and is plugging up the hole. Now here's the thing: Wild Bo will go in de- into massive detail about the weirdest shit, but Imp is not going to talk about how Crawler is fitting through the house. Yeah, like, hole? Imp, when she's, like, doing her tracking process of the Nine, she only found them because of, like, a trail of blood leading there. I think she would have noticed, like, a big-ass lizard bear <laughs> ass coming out of the side of the building. Which has, uh, by the way, dropping testicles or whatever the fuck. Ovaries, rather. Yeah, his testicles are inside his body. It, it, we never actually said what the Word of God was. His yes. testicles are in his body because dangling is not a good adaptation. There you go. You heard it here first. Crawlers, he, I think Wild Bo's explicitly said, Crawler's too advanced for that. <laughs> but yeah, um, feel free to jump on that. Um, I also, I do have a comment to highlight here from one of our older Ooh. videos. Oh, yeah. uh, Todd Bell says, sometimes Wild Bo is just too subtle, and there's a beat here in the story that's delivered so offhand that it doesn't really get a chance to horrify. Ooh. Slice and Dice keeps pressuring Amy to cross her boundaries and to do that and to and to take what she wants and if she does then he'll go away. Then while Taylor is dealing with Jack, Amy yells something that Taylor can't make out and he goes away. The protagonist didn't pick it up, so for the longest time neither did I. The debate about whether Amy is tragic good or evil bad may never be settled, but the implications here are super icky. So that's interesting. I didn't catch this at all. I'm sure you've caught this in your multiple reads. Uh, I actually hadn't. It is very subtle. And uh, I want us to use this as a scale. Like, nor- normally you have, like, chaotic good or, like, lawful evil. I want I want the scale that has tragic good and evil bad. <laughs> evil bad. Evil bad. <laughs> um, I really appreciate this comment. I love people pointing out these little subtleties. Yeah. Um, and that's a good one. So, like, I guess the point here is we don't know what she yelled to Jack that made him leave. What could she yell that would make him leave aside from, like, I'll do it. Like, the way Todd Bell is saying it here, it seems like she said something important. I guess we'll find out in the future. Find out next time. 
Not this time. But however, here's what we're going to find out. Yes. Uh, we haven't recorded in about two weeks now. So it's the, been a long time. The, the stockpile of chapters, I was... I, uh, the second half of Arc 16 was too good. I just had to also do 17. What can I say? Um, some people were like, oh, you say the Sibmerg is coming up. Boy, you don't even know. I know now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know now how right I was. So... Without further ado, I did 16 and 17, and by God, me and Bradley are just going to go for it. Uh, this is a big chunk of the story, and it's going to feel good to rip off that Band-Aid. Yeah, gonna... like, looking at, uh, I remember at one point looking at, like, stats of Worm, and I think by a pretty wide margin, 16 is the longest arc. I cannot express to you and the people at home... <clears throat> how happy i am to get past dark 16 i feel like i've actually finally made a true dent into worm oh yeah like i think i remember looking word count wise before you start 16 you're still before the halfway point and when it's done you're like not an insignificant amount past the halfway point holla i'm getting there guys i'm and i'm you know what i've been super into it worm has gotten really good I really like this uh this arc that you're currently on. Uh, I like it too so far. I, I we'll talk about it when I will talk about eighteen. But let's do sixteen. Right. I got I because we're talking about so much. I have a very structured plan of what we're gonna talk about at which point. First of all, Piggo interlude plus her capture. So during that interlude, you were like, "Man, I really like this interlude coming up." I was going through it and I was like, "Man, being a PRT just sucks." And it was at the end where she reveals who she is that it's like, oh, this is – this explains kind of everything and also paints Pigot as really tragic to where she lost her future because in general, like, she, she views these superhero people as monsters where when they fight, innocent, normal people get caught in the struggle and get horribly mangled – and just nil bogs out here making children that will just eat your ass. And it's like, I can totally understand why she has such a harsh stance on capes now. So yeah, I thought this because, was a really good interlude. Like, leading up to this interlude, um, she had always been, like, one of the more, like, harsh and uncompromising people on the quote-unquote good guy side. And you're just like, what the fuck? But you realize now that she has pretty much seen the worst of the worst she has seen an s-class threat up close and when the cards were on the table the heroes that were supposed to back up her squad just got out of there and and they just let neil bog take the town so all those deaths were for nothing yeah and uh i think it's really interesting because i don't like th this is obvious this is pigo like we know this for a fact but I don't think it ever explicitly says her name in the chapter. The only way people would know is she kind of has like a catchphrase where it's like the world's gone crazy and I'm the only sane person left. And she I, says, I do her, recall her saying that before. Yeah. And that's the last line in the uh, chapter. And uh, I think you caught onto that. You're like, this was Pigo, right? No, uh, I, I had to ask you. I was like, yeah, you, you asked me if it was, I was like, is this someone we should know? But I had in mind, it's like, I think it's Pigo. Yeah, and so, like, sometimes, like, sometimes I, I, want, I worry that Wild Bow might be too subtle, because obviously not everyone is going to pick up on that, but for the people who do, it's really cool, like, oh, I bet that's Pigot, but... But man, what I if think... you go through this story never picking that up, and, like, I feel yeah. like Pigot loses such a important part of her character if yeah, you do that, it's, you know? It's so important for her character that you understand this is her interlude, so um, I always worry if that's too subtle um i also want to talk about talk a little bit about when she gets captured yes um oh we didn't go through the summaries but you know what there's just no time Keep um going. when she gets chap when she gets captured i really like how she is turning the table on both tattletale and taylor which chapter was that um uh, probably like 16.3 or something like that yeah it was 16.3 so one of the lines i really like there is will you explain away every evil you've done and only count the things you want um 
which is a semi-fair and kind of unfair criti- critique on uh, Skitter, where she does uh, she does take responsibility for some of the things she does, but she also has a tendency to justify anything she does and only you know just explain it away. So Pigo kind of has a read on her, but it's not a hundred percent. Yeah. And just in general, you kind of have to be in awe of how she just does not give a fuck. Yeah, she's probably been in... You almost have to wonder if she's been in a situation like this before. And she's like, I know I'm ugly, and I know I'm fat, and I know I'm hideous, and you, no matter what you say, you can't get to me. It's like, oh, your Damn, self-esteem girl. is shit. I feel so bad. Because I also know how you got here. Um, oh, yeah. Which one came first? Was it the interlude? Uh, this came. I yeah, it was right after the interlude. Yeah, which, uh, it, that kind of reminds me of um, having like the Ward interlude arc, and then we immediately have the Undersiders like Kick their fight ass. and infiltrate them. So. Yeah, you're um, like, oh no. <laughs> I one thing that like I think Pigo sees capes as what Wildbow is thematically trying to represent them as. At least that's the read that I get. Where there are people trapped with their own trauma who trample others in their battles. And maybe that's not like the big theme that's going on here. But based on everything that we have seen, and especially seeing so much from the villain perspective primarily, I I think this story has justified her worldview pretty clearly. Where, yeah, it's the, all these people who are fucked up from their trauma... And they fight, and people get stung and drowned and fucking blown up by time bombs. And it's just like, in their struggles, Mannequin is just tearing people's heads apart. And, like, just horrible things happen because these people are duking it out because they're all just troubled individuals. Yeah. I don't know if there's any one character who I think has a totally accurate view. I think they all have their own background and their own view on what's going on here. There is some truth in the way she sees the world, but um, I do think there are there are very, very bad sides to these hairy humans, but there are also really, really good sides that we get to see. Um, so I do think there's some truth to her view, but I do think it all, it is also still warped from her experience possibly i'd have to lean with her view at my current state um it's probably the one i'd align myself with the most um the most i say uh there's some parts here where taylor is kind of more self-reflective where she's aware of the way she rationalizes thing and she even admits that saving dinah is partially to appease her own guilt and i just thought those were good moments of introspection introspection rather um Let's talk about... I'm going to jump to the Calvert reveal. Yeah. How did you feel about this? Because I was a little mixed on it. Because as soon as, like... As soon as his plan comes through, he just immediately becomes Calvert. He doesn't even try to be Coil anymore. Yeah. And it's like... I... Sure, you say you have a lot of control on the situation, but it it feels like you're just really revealing a lot of yourself that you don't really have to. It's like in in Naruto, right? Uh, When people take off their, like, disguises, like, they wear these hats, the Akatsuki does, where it's, like, shadowing their face. Or, like, when the organization wears hoods, and then they reveal themselves once, and they never put the hoods back on ever again. So it's like, oh... These were just on for the viewer. I don't care that my identity is exposed now. Like, that's the vibe I get when I see stuff like that. Yeah, and I... That wasn't even the part that jumped out to me. What jumped out to me was how they get to, oh, this is Thomas Calvert, which, like, I understand... Like, I can understand how how they got there, but I think we needed to see that process because... Yeah. I think their actual explanation for how they deduced it was Thomas Calvert was like one all this like everything that happened they noticed was like extremely convenient for this Thomas Calvert person and from there Tattletail's Hermit Purple was able to be like oh it's Thomas Calvert but I, I think we 
maybe did that a little too quickly, which when Worm is very verbose and when it does something too quickly, that's kind of odd for it. I was just going to say that Worm will spend minutes and minutes and minutes of Taylor analyzing a power of like, oh, uh, Prism's doing this and this and this and this and this, but then they skip over a potentially interesting conversation and realization of the Undersiders figuring out that it's Calvert. I think it's interesting that you call him Calvert. Um, oh, yeah, I don't know what it's... I don't know. There's the a... audiobook does call him Calvert. G- give, me, give me another word of God on this one. <laughs> That's my word of God. Um, yeah, uh, it's kind of odd. Um, but some good shit comes out of this. Before we get to that, let me jump to the Defiant interlude. Ooh. Where I'm really bummed that Hook Wolf is just the straight up killer now. Like, they kind of lost all subtlety. I kind of like, I was a bit of a defender for him. Where I was like, I can understand why he's doing all he does and he has these positive traits. And now, you know, he's just out here murdering people. And like, he's just a part of the nine now. He's not even there doing like his revenge thing that he said he was going to do. I know a big part of it is that. He never got the cure for the, uh, like, brain prion or prion. Oh, what and, the fuck? That is interesting to think about. And, uh, Panacea noted as she was making the cure that if someone was not to get it, it would, like, continue to damage their brain outside of even the stuff that it was already making them forget. So I imagine he's just, like... I hope that comes back if we see him again. I, I would like them to readdress this, because that'd be cool. So I almost wonder if he's, like, even still lucid at this point and, and like there's another part yeah we're with shatterbird not even there anymore he lost his primary reason and it's just they conclude that jack and hook wolf's personalities are playing off each other in kind of like a mutually beneficial where the benefit here is just the depravity of their souls um so i the story seems to point that it, it was like a it is their personalities but it could be what you're saying or a mix of both probably Um, a mix of both i love how defiant so i was worried it was like they took arm master he they turn him into a robot he's probably gonna lose a bunch of his personality actually he's still very much arms master and there's points here where he's trying to sympathize and explain certain things to appease like the police woman he's talking to but dragon is the one that's trying to steer him into more of a robotic focused path yeah. Um, and he has just enough humanity while still being this cool cyborg where I'm like, you know what? No, this is a cool change. And I like the interplay between him and, uh, dragon. Yeah. And one really cool thing that I don't know if we talked about last time, cause we first saw defiant as defiant, I think last time. Yes. And we you know whenever he was first whenever he first encountered the nine when mannequin came to him mannequin's whole deal is that he wants someone to fundamentally change maybe not even just themselves but also their body to kind of give up a part of their humanity which is what a lot of the nine wants to do yeah and even though they didn't accomplish that to colin while they were in brockton bay colin in this new pursuit of the nine has given up parts of his humanity parts of his own body and he's become a cyborg God for the and of chasing them down so whether he knows it or not they did change him wow and it's exactly how mannequin would want him to change him yeah and that is just that is crazy to me and it really made me like defiant a lot more than i already did but also, like, part of it is also he gets a closer connection to Dragon, so it's not all negative, I think. Uh, um, I mean, in his mind, this is a a blooming relationship as well. Don't they talk about how, like, I could vibrate your penis and make you feel things? <laughs> <laughs> so there's that going on. Um, there's, this, on vibrate, baby. there's this really good line where Defiant says, Maybe I was too hard on Skitter. She had reasons for doing what she did. That, I think, is such a huge line. Um, and maybe it's because we don't often see ourselves from Arms Master's view. 
But for someone that Taylor uses as like an argument piece of like, hey, our master's a piece of shit, so all you hero systems are not like the system of heroes is not good. Just remember that our master did this. Yeah. And it's he's like... the only hero who has ever seen her side of it. Yeah, she is not going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Like for her, he's the proof that the system is broken. And then we flip it on his side and he's like, you know what? Maybe I need to try to understand where she's coming from. That call in top five. He's he's a he's a good boy. He's top five. That's all I'm saying. He's, he's so good, cool. He's good um, Dragon had a proper trigger event, which is an important plot point here. And then she's like, "Ask about Cauldron when we're done." So I'm thinking Cauldron is more late game than I thought. I was thinking they would be like before we started tackling some Endbringer and Noel stuff. Oh but yeah, I, was, I, I was think wrong. Uh, originally the your like timeline for it was like Coil and then Cauldron. Yeah, I was then... like Coil then Cauldron would be like the the way I would think it would go. But I mean, now that I know Cauldron's also like in in leagues with the Triumvirate, they were backing Coil. It's like oh, they are bigger than I thought as a villain. They're big boys. You know what's interesting about Cauldron? I don't know when this would come up, but like. Their success rate of making heroes is allegedly pretty high because they're making people that don't go through actual trigger events. Yeah, and I can't remember if that was think, something they said in Batteries Interlude. I think it mostly came up. It, it really became apparent in the, uh, Alexandra's Interlude, which I think was last arc. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't think we talked about it then. I just think that's interesting, right? Like... You gotta hand it to them. That is nice. Superpowers without the baggage of trauma because it totally makes sense that so many of these heroes would be fucked up because they have to go through proper trauma and trigger events. Alright, let's talk about the meat and potatoes. This is the final part we're going to talk about for Arc 16, which is the longest arc, so I think we're doing great. Um, The finale and the encounter. Um... I have gone on record complaining about a lot of warm action where I think the things that Wild Bo enjoys in his action scenes are like anti-Willer where like he really focuses on like explaining every little detail of the power and having Taylor like go through these really really long monologues and to understand how to get past the situation even if the situation's really tense and I don't think she could reasonably have such clear thoughts and like think for so long in these kinds of situations. I've talked about it all. The fight against Coil when she's in the burning house is the best worm fight for me. I uh I'm always excited to get back to this chapter. It was so cool and so intense and I you can really summarize the fight I've only read it once. It's something I would like to... Like, there's not many worm chapters I immediately want to go back to. This is one I do. Um, Where, like, a lot of the fight is just Taylor finding a way to get her bugs to redirect all the soldiers' guns and grenades and get them to kind of screw each other up so she can make enough chaos to come out the other side and, like, just blow them up with a flashbang. And, like, she's been in dire situations before, and like you said, she usually has a lot of presence of mind, but there's a few times where she, like, is about to lose it. Like, whenever she initially gets shot, she's like, oh my god, I'm dead. It went right through me. Yeah, And it's like, okay, well, no, it didn't. And then once the fire starts and she realizes how fucked she is, she actually, like, starts, like, giggling and almost laughing at how fucked she is. She, there's multiple lines where she's, coughing horrendously and like hyperventilating they wild Bo did fantastic like this is i i i really like this one Cla- clapping to you sir you did Ooh, great big claps uh, big claps um that led to what i didn't really like was that weird box that controls her bugs uh, i don't know about that fam yeah well, i think they commissioned it from leet who is still around that's true. I did like that Lee and Uber still showed up. Um, the biggest deal with that for me that I liked wasn't necessarily the box. It was the the fake Taylor betraying the Undersiders. That mostly sh- because... That shit was like, weird, but I, th- I think I liked it. I really liked it because 
this is now coming after we've been in Rachel's head before, and we know mm. like how badly the thought of betrayal hurts her, and she just saw Taylor betray her in front of her own eyes, and she wastes no time. She's like, find Skitter, hurt, kill, like kill her now. Yeah, and it also like Cherish was like, hey, you know she's gonna betray you, right? Like this yeah. is the fear that like has been iterated both within her mind and through Cherish that like this is something that will fuck Rachel up. Yeah. So I can't wait for Taylor to truly betray her in the future. Ooh. Um the whole clone thing was a little weird. I was like, "Oh my fucking god, they got like alternate earth Taylor up in this." Like I was freaking out, but no, it was just a body double. Yeah, I don't even know if they're I don't, I don't even know if there is an alternate earth Taylor. I I realized that I mean I wasn't at Arc Seventeen yet, so I didn't really get how the alternate Earth really functioned oh, yeah. up until that point. <laughs> Soon we'll talk about this. Um, I do like their like their plan is exactly what I thought it should have been, so I was content with that. Where it's like we're gonna pretend like we killed Skitter, and we're gonna be mad because it's like, hey, Coyle, obviously you had something to do this with this. Um. There's so much good in this arc, but there's also so much negative. For example, the liberal use of teleporting got really annoying here. Where it's just like, oh yeah, now you're you're surrounded by all these people. Haha. <laughs> we just beamed threats around you and it's like Okay. Alright. Not not that compelling when there's just like technology that will do this, uh just kind of pretty suddenly introduced like it was it, it was part of also the like uh quote-unquote self-assassination plan to kill coil um either way uh let's talk about there's one more negative i don't think they could have set up the fake dead body that quick like fuck off with that they had like a like 20 minutes to 30 minutes to set all that up which is very hard to believe and go to the mall or whatever where they were gonna meet up they uh as far as like arc 15 and 16 go um like i do like the arcs because i mean i like pretty much everything in the story but these are usually two arcs that i'm not eager to get back to and that might just be because they're sandwiched by like two arcs which i really really love and so i'm like oh yeah it's that one that's between those other arcs i like so mm -hmm. i don't know it's but like yeah, there's stuff like that. And also, like, going back to what I was saying, which just dialogue and worm kind of rubs me the wrong way, right? So when they have Taylor at gunpoint, Calvert specifically says, you know what? I can kill you right now if, you're, if your uh, leak of information is real. That's fine. I can manage that better than I can manage you being alive. So he lays down a baseline of, like, I can kill you, but let me let you talk anyways, right? Which is something that I can excuse a lot of times. But when you have a story that takes itself so seriously, with a villain that has shown himself to be this ruthless, I think it invites a little more criticism from me. To the point where it's like, Coyle lets Taylor talk for so much. And the way she talks also rubs me off the wrong way, where she's really like, and I was really paying attention to it, and she was just speaking like Skitter. You would expect someone at gunpoint, like, putting a last effort in like she is, like she is on her last leg, she's just trying to hold on, to be more frantic. But she's like, speaking the way Skitter normally speaks, just trying to get as much information as time as usual. And like, it didn't have that sense of urgency that like I would want to see in a situation like this so it ends up just feeling like same me dialogue um i'll leave that at that i it rubbed me off from what was otherwise the best scene in all of worm because now we're gonna get to the really good stuff which is the turnaround actually no there is another problem <laughs> I guess I had more problems than I remember. This is Worm Sucks, the episode. <laughs> no, I didn't want it to be like this. All right, let's get this problem out of the way first. I don't like how the solution to this arc was that Tattletale made more money than Coil off screen. 
D- defend this for me, Bradley, because you're good at like putting a good spin on these things to where I can appreciate them more. Uh, I wasn't prepared for this because I didn't really <laughs> think it needed a spin because I was fine with it. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, mean, I was afraid of this. <laughs> Coil was never someone who lended himself to making any kind of actual personal connections or loyal bonds the only people who would ever be with him are people who are after money Mm -hmm. um so i mean if you needed a spin that's probably what i would say but uh i was fine with it uh yeah that's pretty good i guess for me it was just like Coil's like, there's no way you made more money than I did. I was keeping track of your money. And she was like, yeah, I did. <laughs> it's just like, it's, I don't usually say like, oh, show, don't tell. Because I feel like that can get really obnoxious. But let me be obnoxious just this once where it's like, it, it felt like it came out of nowhere. I definitely buy her flipping over the guy she was working with. Because they had a pretty good working relationship. But getting pretty much like half of his mercenaries without him finding out and without us seeing it just feels really convenient to me we'll uh, uh we'll have the episode where tattletale makes all of her money in the uh netflix adaptation oh uh, it's already so long <laughs> we'll have to just add another line to explain it um yeah if anyone in the comments like defend that for me if you can like i i do like when people can help me appreciate something i might not um, cause aside from that, I get to finally get to the thing I was really wanting to talk about, which is the scene. He's finally defeated. He's pleading for his life. He's all out of options. And just the way that this next part is written is just fucking beautiful. Where as, as it's going down, there's this line where it's like Taylor steps forward or like I took a step forward and it doesn't explain why she is, but the reader immediately knows why she is. Cause like it, it's clearly building up to it. And it's something that we have built up to so well. Um, and I really didn't think it would be now. Like I thought she would really kill one of the nine, you know, I thought that would be it. Yeah. Like but, we always knew she was eventually going to kill someone in this story. Yeah. But we never knew who. And like, you know what, this was, it was, it was the right choice dragging it out just a little bit further because you got this amazing moment. It had to be coil she gets the gun and it's like i think he says something like you're not a killer and she's like well if i am you made me this way and then she just plops his head um before that i really like the um traveler stepping in and being like you can't do that trick or skitter i'm not gonna let you do that and then they pretty convincingly disarm them by first of all they take out trickster with imp Ballistic is already like kind of on the borderline and this is a really good payoff for his time with Taylor to where like I could see where their back and forth and back and forth might have helped them be able to at least understand that he can side with the undersiders here. Um, Genesis and Sundancer aren't really going to be aggressive about the situation but they're also not going to betray Trickster which I thought was really interesting and it's even more interesting uh, when we talk about the next arc. Yeah, and um, uh, just as far as the actual act of uh, killing Coil goes, I I feel like it would be really tempting to, like, if, if there was ever someone that Taylor's justified in killing, <laughs> at this point, it would probably be Coil. Yeah, it's and, Coil or one of the nine. For yeah, me. and it would be really easy, considering how justified she is, to just like you know you know shoot him and then she pulls the gun up she blows the smoke out of the barrel and she's like you had it coming but she in this moment when she kills him she's still kind of unnerved by the act of killing someone she shoots the gun and like she she drops it and it clatters and she kicks it away i like, really like that touch where she kicks it she away killed someone. and uh the thing though is that she doesn't feel bad about it at least I believe her when she says that personally. Yeah, she's yeah, I believe a, her too. she can be unreliable, but she's like, yeah, I, I'm I'm more uh, I'm more weirded out that I don't feel bad about it. And I was like, this is not even like edgy, like oh you're so edgy because you killed. Like no, this is super justified. I thought that was really well built up. 
the sound of the ocean waves as that's happening is such a good scene builder. Yeah. Please put this in a Netflix show, Wild Bo. Hire me. Netflix uh, only, no Hulu. <laughs> it's such a gorgeous scene. Um, and, like, Rachel holding Taylor's hand as they're driving away without saying anything is just... Ah, oh, that that makes my heart feel warm feelings. Warm not feelings, girl. not warm feelings. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just thought it was really cute, despite the horrific act and like a really good showing of their clearly growing relationship. Oh, this was at this point the best moment in Worm. I'm saying it. You heard it here first. And uh, I like this climax more than I like the Sla- Slaughterhouse Nine climax. Well, there you go. If it wasn't for the frankly extended dragon half of this arc, this might have been one of my favorite arcs, actually. I, I notice I didn't even talk about the dragon half, and I won't, because I want to get to 17. Yeah. But, uh, and, like, even after that, like, awesome conclusion to Coil, at the very end of the chapter, something we've been, like, waiting to happen for almost the whole story finally happens. They reveal that Noel has escaped. Yeah. So it's just like, oh, we just had a thing we've waited a long time for happen, and then another thing we waited a long time for happens, and it's just like, I'm getting everything I wanted. Little did I know, I wasn't getting what I thought I was. I was getting something better. Ooh. Arc 17. Arc um, 17, love it or hate it. No, actually, you know what? Love it. Love it. This is the best arc in Worm. I'm saying it now. I'll say, I, I think I had told you before that this is, like, I've, I've, I think I've said, like, my top three arcs many times, and this is definitely I it my was... second. This is my second. This and 30 and 14? This, uh, I think it was 30, 17, and 11. But uh, 17 Ooh, is just, man. I just love 17. 11 do be good. Uh, I Okay, this was incredible. Uh, the Travelers are my favorite group. They all got infinitely better from this. Where do I begin? I guess with the reveal, right? I'm like, what is this team that they're joining? Like, what is going on here? After the shock that we were going to get a whole Traveler arc, I, I thought it would be like an interlude or something. No, yeah. we're going to get the whole arc. And I can tell because, like, this is 17.1 and it's Traveler stuff. It's going to be like the War Dark. Um, and it's... You build this up to where they're just like, hey, by the way, we're gamers. And I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, like, I never expected a team in Worm to be, like, a high school esports team. It was so jarring because then all shell all hell breaks loose and the simurg is there by like the end of the first episode or first chapter yeah let's step back and i i made a meme out of this because, oh yeah <laughs> and i will post this with the reddit post for this and maybe you can look it up in the parahuman subreddit um because it's like the first meme i ever made i just felt so compelled by the whiplash we just finished this really emotional chapter where the ending stinger is the fact Noel has been released and is clearly a massive threat. You you then show the very beginning of all these conflicts that the Travelers have had. And you could say that like a, the domino piece of you kick someone out of your esports team leads to Noel destroying Brockton Bay. And, yeah. Which is, by the way, in another fucking planet, which you don't find out till like halfway through this arc. Which yeah. is incredible. It's just it's crazy. And I mean, speaking of that, there's so many cool subtle hints where like Jess is like, why is the Simurg here? And none of the people really seem to know about the heroes and only Jess is the one that has kept up with them. Yeah, because it's like before the reveal that they're from the planet without super things. Think, is, is it Earth Aleph? Aleph? Yeah. I think, uh, I think back, because like you know, the idea of this alternate Earth isn't out of nowhere. Like, it was briefly mentioned, like, once or twice earlier in the story. Yeah. And uh, I think back when it was first mentioned, I think Taylor said, like, oh, you know, we discovered them because we have powers. But I think they let them take Aleph instead of 
like bet because it was like a show of goodwill. Yeah, I was wondered. Um, but uh, yeah, and you're just like, wait, how do these people not know anything about? They, they don't know as much as they should about super things, and uh, we eventually find out why. So let's jump right into the Simmer, right? Because she is the driving force between this entire arc. Um, finally, another Endbringer, and like a full Endbringer, not just a little Behemoth part. I can very, very confidently say that Behemoth is the lesser of the three for me. Because the Simurg is fucking rad and terrifying. Simurg is my favorite. I love her so much. The way she moves is already creepy. Like, it says, like, she bounds and, like, just floats halfway across the street. And just picturing this giant woman floating towards these kids that are on top of buildings while, like, people are fighting her. It's just fascinating. She's smart enough to build a portal to other worlds. Which is my one negative about this arc is the monsters. Um... Not that they exist, though I would like an explanation to why the fuck they exist. Is there an Earth, Earth Sea, maybe? That uh, like has if all. If you're monsters? wondering, there is an explanation for why they exist. But, was, uh, did I miss it in this arc, or is that I, later? I I don't think you missed anything. Okay, cool. Okay, um, it's there's the section, and you know what? Maybe this will be remedied when I find out what these monsters actually are. But there's this kind of like, it was a little confusing to go through section where Klaus, or Kraus rather, is um, facing off against some of them. And he's like at the lab. And he's like, it's right before he gets the vials. And like that just felt like a big pace breaker to this disaster movie where you're introducing these like new antagonists. It just felt off. But that's literally the only complaint I have about this whole arc. Which is the least complaints I've ever had about any worm arc. So there you go. That just goes to show you. Um, it's official. It's official. Back to the Simmer, right? Like, her power is just incredibly horrifying. Where she sings, and if you're in her range for long enough, she gets some subconscious control over your actions. She can also see the future. So it's like, you become what they what they describe as a human guided missile where at some point in the future you will cause some atrocity that will cost human lives as a result yeah and it's like it's a unique kind of horror because before we even find out what she does there's like some hero and he has one of the dragon armbands that we've seen before and it detonates killing him and they deduce oh he must have been here too long yeah and you just and there's various other moments like that in this arc where they're innocent civilians who can't leave because who knows what event they could put into motion years from now. Mm -hmm. They're all quarantined. And back to those dominoes, Noel is now rampaging, rampaging through Brockton Bay. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that's the event, right? But I could see this being even bigger brained. Where it's like, oh, you <laughs> thought that was it, but really, it was where Trickster switches the dildos in the future, which causes millions to die. Oh, you knew. I knew. It was very obvious from the start. Um, so I can def I definitely think the Noel thing is a red herring, but you know what? It fits. It, it, it fits uh, the motto or like the the modus operandi here. Yeah. Um, various times in this arc. Kraus thinks to himself, man, fuck the Simurg, because he's very expertly driven into a corner in if, to use the power vials that they got. And yeah. I, I just really like how it, it did a really good job on railroading him to a point where it's like, it, believably, I can see why he thinks that now is the time to use the vial and that he's forced to do it, because either I don't use the vial and Noel dies, or I use it and... He even, like, he's very self-centered where he's like, guys, this is all happening for me. Like, I'm going to be the one to use the vial. It's all happening, so I use it, and I'll just lock myself and play video games for the rest of my life. This is clearly short-sighted. It's all part of a bigger plan. Yeah, he just, like, gets caught in that classic philosophical debate where it's like, you know, if things are deterministic, he's like, if 
I'm going to, if no matter what choice I make is what she wants me to do, then I might as well do whatever I want, because no matter what, it's going to be the worst possible thing. And so he uses that as his justification for getting these powers. <laughs> and, like, he's so clearly also led. Like, at first I was like, oh, how convenient that he found this box of superpowers. But no, it was staged so he would stumble upon it, you know? Yeah, and, like, one that particular moment where he finds the box, I'm going to um, steal an analysis from... We Scott and Matt at We've Got Worm. Ooh, that's a spoiler because... for me because I haven't gone to the. <laughs> I don't watch the episodes we haven't discussed yeah. yet. I just I feel like it really needs to be. It's something that I think needs to be discussed when discussing Arc Seventeen, mm -hmm. and that the sequence where he finds the box and he realizes what he stumbled upon these powers, he consciously thinks to himself like, "Oh, this is a bad thing. The Simmer probably set this up," or he's like man, imagine how much damage you could do with powers. And he makes the decision to put the brief briefcase down. He sets the briefcase down, and he never, ever mentions picking it back up. What? But at the, end, at the end of the chapter, it says he left with the briefcase in hand. Like, he consciously knows how bad of an idea it is. He sets it down. And it's almost like without thinking about it, he picks as it if back guided, up. he picked it back up. What the fuck? That's so good. And there's like even more things like that where there's the part where he's looking at the um, the bird bashing its head against its cage. Yeah, what was that all? Yeah, that was weird. And he's like, man, that's terrifying. Imagine what like a sentient being with opposable thumbs could do. And then without skipping a beat, he picks up a knife. <laughs> that and is uh that is pretty good actually it's just the simmer fucking with him oh dude now to wrap up the simmer talk here because i feel like the bulk of what i want to talk about is actually the character relationships yeah um the simmer worries me in some way where it's like what is retroactively going to be simmer based events you know like there could be some things where, like, it's injected into past parts of the story just to, like, heighten tension or, like, oh, it was all part of a bigger plan because simmered. So it is a plot point that could be, like, abused to maybe artificially create something out of something that wasn't there before. Now, maybe Wild Bo has always been big brain and has always thought about this. But when you introduce the simmer over halfway through the story, you do open yourself to that kind of, like thought experiment where it's like was this always meant to be a big deal or did you go back and kind of like make it something bigger than it was planned to and it might feel unnatural if he does that so i'm interested to see how more simmerg actions are going to play out thoughts okay uh, okay. i mean on one hand i'm like optimistic about that because i mentioned that in an earlier draft of worm this was arc one um, right. Granted, Wildbo said at the time it was written much worse and there was much more context because we knew less about the universe. But mm -hmm. um, clearly this is something that he always kind of had planned out before the events of the story. So Good point, good point. Yeah, at least like in context of the story, like maybe there's the potential for things to like we learn like, oh, that was something the Simmerick had its hand in. But I don't think there was anything that retroactively Wild Bo was like, oh, maybe I should have made it so that's, that's a Simmerg thing. I think he had this uh, planned out. Nice. All right. We'll see where this goes. I'm excited. Um, I want to talk about the group now because this whole arc was really – the Simmerg was a nice bonus – but to me, the main draw of it was the tensions of this group and the inner relationships. Yeah. And why not start with Kraus, right? Ooh. Um, Kraus was so interesting. Uh, by the end of it, I really started to see parallels between him and Taylor. Where uh, the way Cody explains it and kind of the way you can, you can see some of his actions. And like, while Kraus, seeing it from his mind, it doesn't seem as bad. I could easily see it from someone else's mind and make it seem like he's a he's a leech you know he worms yeah. his way into this group he starts dating noel he forces his way into a leadership role when everything falls apart 
and it's like he forces himself into this group and everyone kind of lets his shit slide because he's pretty good at putting a spin on it and like he's already introduced himself as this kind of personality so it's something they, they already expect this out of him like these shenanigans out of him you know yeah and it drives cody fucking insane he's like why do you guys not see that like he's getting by by the skin of his teeth all his little stunts that he's pulling like he's only getting by because you guys aren't calling him out on it he's getting really lucky i really don't trust that his intentions with noel were pure but also cody's a piece of fucking shit that's the thing it's like like, uh, it's really it's a really complex relationship there with both both kraus and cody it's like there are aspects of the personality i can look at i'm like wow you are such an asshole but I think they both bring up really valid points about each other where Cody tries to point out how Kraus can be manipulative, whether Kraus knows it or not. He does manipulate people to a degree. I and think so, yeah. Kraus is totally right that Cody really has a chip on his shoulder. He needs to prove himself and kind of be the alpha. Yeah. And uh, that these things just drive them apart. It's really fascinating. Um, Man, I, I gotta say I dislike Cody a lot more because he's not a team player at all. Uh, you pointed out that sequence where he's like, I got a power that completely counters you. And then uh, Kraus gets him in like a little time loop where he just abuses his power for like and just shows its negative traits. So it's like, oh, even when you're winning, I'm still beating you. And it, God, I, I could like, I could see how Cody could be infuriated because he got oh, shit like, on at every turn. That was that was probably like, if Cody was not already completely far gone after that, I, I think there was no coming back after that. Getting humiliated to that degree was was probably the, the actual final straw. Let's talk about the other group members because this made me like all of them, uh, specifically Genesis and uh, B- Ballistic, right? I've joked before that Ballistic is like, oh, Ballistic's the one person in the party who has, like, no personality. I think I said that, like, arc 13 or 14. Yeah. 15, we got some time with him. And, you know, he, he was kind of – it was kind of like a negative point where, like, him and Taylor were just going back and forth because they didn't see eye to eye. But looking at it now, I can definitely understand why he's so apathetic and fed up with his current situation and uncooperative even and even through all that he still couldn't kill a girl because he saw her as like as a human he it reminded her him of like a middle school friend it's like at one point in this guy's life he was just a kid who wanted to play his favorite game for a living and then his friends have all this drama and then being from another world ruins his life and yeah. he is just so done with all this shit i he's awesome now i think that's man and the way like he's so numb to the stuff happening around him i feel like because he's like in shock like when chris or what's his name is it chris uh i think chris was like their friend who died yeah. off the bat when chris dies he's like chris is dead like I, he's just from that point on, he is just going through it. His leg is yeah. injured. He's putting up with so much shit. He's trying to get Cody in line. He's trying to make sure Kraus doesn't run off and do something stupid. I'm going to say it. Uh, Luke is my worm equivalent. Like, he's the closest person to me. I can yeah. relate to him now. Yeah, for context, we were trying to figure out who, like, everybody on this podcast would be if they were a character in Worm. And, uh, it was very I, difficult. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we settled on Luke for Willie. Who are you? Who are you? I, if I'm anybody, I think we said maybe like Danny. I, um, you got some not, Sundancer vibes. I could see it. I could see it. Of course, Sundancer. I don't. I don't, don't want to be anybody in this story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Everyone, <laughs> everyone fucking sucks. Um, Mars. Mars is so sweet, and I feel bad that she had to live with the mega bitch. And she just was not cut out for this life, man. But, and I, I pointed that out. I was like, I think it was we were in the car, actually. We were like driving and listening um, in our road trip. And I was like, man, Mars just doesn't have it in her. I didn't know her name was Mars. Sundancer yeah. doesn't have it in her. It's surprising she's a villain at all. And you just look at this, it's like she, she had no choice. She's from another world. What is she going to do? 
It's yeah. very sad. It's like this person who never wanted to be a part of this, given like an exclusively lethal power, and she just doesn't know what to do with it. And at every turn, every time we've ever seen her in combat, she just doesn't want to do it. Yeah. And it's the same with Ballistic. Like, he was like, I wanted to fly, and now I have an exclusively lethal destructive power. Even yeah. Luke wasn't excited about that. Um, And, like, even when she's like, I really wanted to run away from home, but, like, being out here, is it weird that I miss my mom? And it's like a combination of, like, the grass is always greener on the other side, but also just... The horrifying, like you're you're in such a bad situation that you miss your horrible mother. Like that's how yeah. frustrating this is. Now Jess, dude, Jess shot up so much in my in like my rankings. I think she's so cool. Um, her turmoil of knowing exactly what their situation is and trying to hold it in, the way that like when everyone's exploding on Klaus or Kraus, um, where it's like, why didn't you fucking tell us you knew what was happening? And Jess just, like, looks over at him, and, like, she's just letting him take the brunt of, of the rage. He's like, I'll, I'll, I can be the bad guy. It, it was a good moment for him, and a really humanizing moment for her. Um, just the fact that she's in this wheelchair, and uh, Kraus is like, I wish I could treat her normally, and, like, She's the most attractive here, or, like, she's one of the most attractive here, but I wish I could pretend like she's not in the wheelchair, but I honestly can't. Uh, you can tell that she gets a lot of that, but also, like, that's such another good moment for Kraus. I think they had such good interplay, actually, yeah, between Yeah, like the you two said, really, really humanizing. Um, and, like, she just gets such a shit end of the stick. She's like, maybe I can walk. He's like, hey, if you take this, you could, you could have sex. And she's like, wait, what? Like that was yeah, a, a big uh, component to getting there. Was like the... these vials, you know, they cure things like maybe cancer or other things, and she's really just hoping she can walk again. And she's super against taking the vial at first, but it's like yeah. if everyone's doing it and there's a chance I can walk, like let's walk then. And, and then she gets a twisted version of it where she can only walk through her projections. And like, man, um, real. Rip Noel, man. I can totally understand why she just became this fresh, like, she becomes a monster, and it's like, her team is in disarray, she has lost her lower half, it's now like a horrifying octopus monster, she can't touch anyone, because it'll make a superpower duplicate of them. Ooh. I, uh, I can see why she would go insane and, like, why it's so desperate that they find help for her and why it just paints everything in such a different picture. Trickster is working so hard to save her. Ballistic knows that this is a doom mission. He even says that right before he defects at the end. The other two are just along for the ride, just trying their best to survive, hoping one day to get back home. Oliver is just a very sad little boy who is very hot. <laughs> yeah and it's just it's such a mess man what a and, uh, what a fa fantastic group of characters yeah the travelers are like how could you how could you not like these boys they're the best group it should have been them i really i really love the travelers a lot i, I would have been perfectly I, I like i would have been very happy if they were the main characters like wildbow considered a lot of people and uh I, I'm sure I could have been happy with probably any of them, but the Travelers are just fantastic. To wrap this off, though, I was saying I went through the best moment in Worm in uh, 16 dot, like, 13. God, such a long sequence, but the ending of Arc 17 blew me away. It was the best thing Wildbo has written so far. Oh, me. man, I'm getting goosebumps. It hit me so fucking hard. Where after all this extended flashback, the last things you hear before you come back to God, dude, it's so good. The last things you hear before <laughs> you come back to the present is <sighs> Trickster with all the hope in the world. It's like, Noel, like, don't be mad. I finally found someone that can like save us. 
and for the first time he feels hope and for the first time even she feels hope it's like this guy coil like he's our chance at making this all better and then the motherfucker wakes up jess and mar mars is behind him knocked out ballistic is gone jess is just staring off into the distance you hear the waves and that's where like i it clicked all oh, their back where coil died because of the waves really good the wave sound man and it's like and then he looks around and he just sees a pile of flesh and some seagulls and you realize it, it, it's like even throughout all of that it didn't click to me how brutal coil's death was to them until this moment it should have been way more apparent way earlier i guess i was just so invested in the moment that i forgot like the present and when you go back to the present you realize that their only hope is gone killed by taylor he's just a pile of flesh that some seagulls are eating so it's like man under uh how noel feel about that um i can uh spoiler alert she's not fucking happy where i am Oof. and it's oh my god that's um that's the best that's just the best that there ever was um the best i've ever had best arc and worm you heard it here first ladies and gentlemen i love it a lot bradley do you have anything else in arc 17 uh man i just uh th this I, I say this about a lot of things, but this is one of the arcs that I always love coming back to. And um, I, I feel like there's always something you can catch on a reread of arc 17 that you didn't get before. Either like a, a cool character interaction that like harkens back to a earlier chapter or a later chapter maybe, or yeah. something like the Simmerg thing with this briefcase. There's just so much here. Yeah. Like I feel like one thing that I never got on my first read through, but that I had found through, uh, discussion is that like e the powers each of these people get from their vial it it's maybe to a lesser degree than a lot of the powers in worm but it's kind of a twist on what they want where Jess wants to walk and it's like she gets it but only kind of through her projections and it's like ballistic wants to fly but he's grounded he can send other things soaring um Mars was really upset about her home life, her mother forcing her to do all these things and activities she didn't want to do. And by becoming a cape, she's now locked into that. She's always going to have to be doing these things she doesn't want to do. Yeah. And I always kind of wondered, Oliver, like, how does... Too. Yeah. Oliver, I'm like, who has self-doubt uh, self yeah. and, like, personal issues is now this hunk, but he's just... He's the same timid, weak boy on the inside. Yeah, I think Kraus says, like it didn't fix any of the issues on the inside only the outside and just kraus just back to him it's like he's so there's so much going on in that head of his you know and it's like he's a trickster he's a trickster and it's like he's he can be very mature and he can be very immature and it's uh, what a what a good bad lad yeah. that that trickster and i feel and, so um... bad for him through discussion, like one thing I never, I, I, I don't, I don't want to pretend to be galaxy brain. I didn't catch this on my own. And um, I don't know if there's any real confirmation on it. There's a few parts, especially near the front half of arc 17, where um, kind of like whenever they're at the restaurant talking, um, Noel's being really timid when talking to Kraus and it's not necessarily about him. Um, I think it like, mentions something about her food kind of being untouched and there are times where she has to kind of have a talk alone with uh mars and uh there are things she clearly can't tell um other people and i would have to look up all the particular quotes people point out but people have made a case about noel perhaps having like an eating disorder um and now she eats 1300 dollars worth of food every week yeah yikes Whew. baby girl so um i don't know i feel like there's still even more that i'll get out of arc 17 in the future but it's always a joy I... man <laughs> it's always, it's always a, joy. a joy 
I said it's always a joy, and I was like, well. I wonder what happened to those guys. <laughs> I wonder what's going to happen to them. Also, someone died in Worm, like a serious death that wasn't. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there's been a few now, but this is like the most serious one. Still no good guys dying. Coil Same. Mega Dead. Coil, Coil was a great Mega guy. Dead. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, he was allegedly going to help the world. Yeah. Yeah, he was a big part of uh, what whatever plan Cauldron was cooking up, so. And, like, they specifically said he's the only one that can save, like, the world, basically. So, uh, I wonder how they feel about Taylor. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know what else, what, uh, what other worm news we have this week. Um, I went through the comment I wanted to point out. I went through the parallels of Krause and Taylor and how they're both leeches who grow to be the top of their team. I think I covered it all. I, I covered my one concern. Yeah. I guess, uh, oh, if I'm going to announce this anywhere, I guess it would be during this segment because I guess, like, anybody who would be interested is probably listening to this. Yeah. Um, I recently started Pact for the first time. It's very good. Um, I'm not going to do an ongoing series on it like we do with Worm, but sometime in the coming weeks, I might do, like, a five to ten minute, like, impressions on it, which will be mostly spoiler-free except for, like the premise and maybe the first arc um but yeah if I, I figured that if i was gonna announce that anywhere it would be in this segment if i if i read it um we'll do i we will not do arc by arc because yeah. like our podcast is half worm as it is yeah like this is whew. Whew. um but i will do like periodic like checks every few arcs and we'll do spoiler full talks man was this our this is our longest far, podcast this is by far our longest podcast we, well, we I mean, went over 3 30 when you got Breaking Bad, and El Camino, and Worm, like two worms, you Double know, worm. you know, you just got two. I wanted to say one last thing before we leave. Yes, this was the arc that made me look at Bradley through our Discord and say, "Bradley, thank you for recommending me Worm." He, Everybody we did gets it, one. gang. Everybody gets one. Everybody gets one. It took a while, but like, I am so glad I read this story. If it meant getting to this, yeah, very arc seventeen is just too good. Arc 18 looking pretty promising. God, I uh, I just love the entire Noel saga. I'm at a Theo interlude, boy. Ooh, I love my boy. All right, all right. No, no, no. Uh, hypothetical this week. We gotta, we gotta cut this shit off. I am, I'm dying. All right, <laughs> so. you're free, Bradley. Goodbye. Everybody.